Father, we thank you because we know that you are dependable. We can always rest and be confident in you because you are faithful. Always the same. You never change. Father, we thank you because your word says even when we were not faithful, we didn't have to worry about you because you are always faithful. Yes. May we never take our trust away from you to put in anything else because Christ alone is the solid rock and the other ground is but a sinking sand. Father, we give you praise. We thank you. We're just going to read very quickly today from the book. I want to welcome my brother Chris. It's good to see you standing here. Yeah, you better know it. It is good to see you standing here. Praise the Lord. All righty, so just before we all get seated, we're just going to read from the book of Acts chapter 15. Is that an angel? Oh, come on, angel. Wow, I haven't seen you in ages. Give God praise for my sister angel. Good to see you. Come on, I know you were out of state. Good to see you. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. All righty. Acts chapter 15, verse 7. Acts 15, 7. And Ryan, good to see you too. I know you've been uh, on the road. Good to see you. Look at what it says in verse 7. It says, and when there had been much dispute. You see, after a while, you get to know the order of service. I didn't even tell them they can go. They just know. <laughs> Come on now. And that is how after like a couple of minutes, if I ever told you to sit down, you just know. But don't worry. I'll tell you shortly. Acts chapter 15 verse 7 the Bible says and there had been much dispute and when there had been much dispute Peter rose up and said to them men and brethren you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe when Alan came up, he told us how God appointed Paul and he says, the Gentiles will hear of my name from him. And now look at what Peter is saying here also. Peter rose up and said, you know, men and brethren, that a while ago, God chose amongst us that by my mouth. You know, if we will be serious minded about being at peace with one another, we need to know that we are not competitors one with another, but that we are men and brethren. You see, when you approach people to resolve a conflict, you need to first of all resolve the issues of identity. Because if I don't identify with you and you don't identify with me, then how do I get to have a resolution when you constantly see me as the opposition? This season that we're going into by the grace of God, we will begin to walk in the spirit of the wisdom of God for conflict resolution so that we can take care of those things for us to preach the gospel. Peter was like, let's settle disputes. Our mission is to preach the gospel. So every other thing is by the way. So let's set aside every weight and every sin that so easily beset us and let us run with meekness this race that is set before us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are brothers and sisters called together for the same purpose to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, in fact, there is a prayer in verse 22 and we're going to say that and we're just going to see that real quick. So verse 22 of the same Acts 15, look at what it says. The Bible says, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, also called Judas, who was also named Basabas. So this one person has got a bunch of names. And Silas, leading men among the brethren. You see, they're like, look, we will send people, but we're still going to send the same brethren. So the prayer that is in that verse 22 is that we need to recognize that if others have to go and we have to stay, we should still send them. 
in the power of the Holy Ghost, supporting them in love. So the prayer is this, regardless of who is going and wherever they might be going, let us continue to see each other as one team, as one army, and that every work, every work that we do, we do in partnership with the Holy Ghost and with one another in love, in oneness, and in godly agreement in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let us all be seated. Let us all be seated. God is good. Oh yes, the Bible says it pleased the apostles and the elders to send others. When the word apostle itself means the sent ones. And so it doesn't matter whatever it is that anyone else is doing. Let us all recognize that ultimately God gets the glory. Isn't that awesome? And that is the beginning of several things. In fact, I'm going to show you three wisdom nuggets very quickly. Uh, one of them from Proverbs chapter 7 verse 3, another one from Proverbs chapter 14 verse 2. And these are some of the things that God is revealing to us in the times that we're in for effectiveness in ministry. You see, because the time is short. I mean, you see the aggression in the world today. The enemy or the opposition has become so aggressive. They have become so, so aggressive. So this is what I would like for us to do. I know the scriptures are going to come on the screen. You can also read it on your phone. But I want us to really focus on these verses of scripture um, and make sure that we're not distracted by anything at this moment. Let's just all zone in on Proverbs chapter 7 verse 3. Praise the Lord. Now, ah, come on. God is good. God is good. Oh, yeah. You know, I like it when people come and, you know, give us a pleasant surprise. When they don't tell you they're in town, they just show up. It's, uh, you know, the Bible says, oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to be together in unity. I mean, God really loves it. You, you see what I mean? And so that's why you see, I, I get excited, you know, when I haven't seen someone for a while. I almost want to run down here and hug your neck, but I'll see if I can save it for later. Praise the Lord. So Proverbs chapter 7, verse 3. Um, in fact, I am led to read 14 first, and I think it's going to help set a good stage for 7 3. So, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 2. The Bible says, He who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is perverse in his way despises him. The Bible says the one that is perverse in his ways despises the Lord. You know, because sometimes we think we're just being smart. Sometimes we think we're just being worldly. I'm just, you know, I'm just managing myself. I'm doing my own thing. I don't want nobody taking advantage of me. So I'm going to be cunning around people. Even Jesus says, be as cunning as a serpent, gentle as a lamb. We give ourselves all of this justification for not taking the high road. We give ourselves all the justifications for not doing what we should do. You understand what I mean? The Bible says when you're about to bring your offering before the Lord and you know that a brother has ought against you, go out of your way and make peace. Right? We're not peacekeepers, we're peacemakers. You understand what I mean? Jesus says blessed are the peacemakers because they shall see God. You know what it means to be a peacekeeper? You know, if someone is very troublesome and they're always bothering you and they don't like you, you don't like them, you just want to keep the peace, you avoid them. That is peacekeeping. But peacemaking requires for you to go to war, first of all, with your own ego. You understand what I mean? Because, you know, the Bible lets us know that your most deadly enemies are not the ones on the other side of the fence. The Bible says that a man's enemies are those of his household. Your most deadly enemies are the ones that res reside in your thoughts, in your mind, in your past, in your experiences, in your emotions. And so if you haven't overcome your own ego, how dare you attempt to humble somebody else? You know, we have lessons that we have to learn, but most of us are so eager to go teach somebody else a lesson. Oh yeah, oh, I'm not going to talk to them for two days so they know they, 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 that they annoyed me. So by not talking to them for two days, you want to teach them a lesson. 
But yet you haven't even learned a lesson yourself that you can never get those two days back of malice keeping. You never know what God can say through them to you. And what God can say through you to them. But then you are busy teaching them a lesson. You are not the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Spirit do the teaching. Let him do the convicting. You do the work of an evangelist. Spread the love of God. And let God spread his own lessons. The Bible says whom the father loves, he chastises. Let God deal with the other fellow. The Bible says, oh no man, nothing but to love. I do not owe you any lesson. I only need to love you. You understand what I mean? And so we do things like that and we're like, oh yeah, because that's just the way that I've learned to deal with them. And all what not. The Bible says that when you are being perverse like that, you are not just despising the fellow, you are despising God. God has an issue with us when we have issues with others. The Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Oh, whatever you did just now, Emmanuel, it worked. The sound went off for a little bit. So if you can just repeat it, that would be great. Thank you. Without that no man shall see the Lord. Let me quote that scripture again. Follow peace with all men. And you're like, Brother Moses, some people don't even want peace. No matter how many times you want peace, they do not want peace. What do we do about those people? You need to recognize that every time someone presents an opposition to you doing that which is the will of God, it is an opportunity for you to receive a crown that is uncommon. Uh, let me say that again. Jesus says, if someone compels you to go a mile, go with them the extra mile. If somebody wants to take your cloak, give them your tunic as well. And so when you find people who have been difficult, go the extra mile because that is heaven's way of allowing you to win victories that, to be honest, sometimes they're easier to win than you think. Because the Bible says that God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. But we are here scoring cheap points on earth and losing great points in eternity. We're scoring cheap shots against other people. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if somebody has seen to be having the last laugh. Because that is not the last laugh. The last laugh is the laugh you laugh when you are in eternity. That is the laugh that lasts forever. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, that we do not look at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. For the things that we see are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. The, that's, verse, that's verse 18. Verse 17 says that our light afflictions are but for a moment. In the New Living Translation, it says something like our, 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 our current trials or challenges are small. You see that person that is making you feel like they have won the argument and now you're feeling like you have lost. That is a small defeat. Because after a while, that which was an argument will no longer be an argument. You know, one of the things that I have learned, that I have learned and that I want to continue to grow in is the fact that if I am convinced within myself by the Holy Ghost and the word of God that I am right, I don't have to argue with you. Because it's just a matter of time. After a while, you will realize it. Now, it doesn't matter if your ego doesn't let you come to me to say, well, actually, you were right. No, as long as you realize it in your heart, deep cause to deep, that's where it matters. It doesn't matter what kind of facade or front you're trying to put up. It don't bother me. Because the truth of the matter is that I know that eventually everyone will stand and give an account before their maker. And when you're giving an account before God, you're not going to call me and say, well, actually, uh, you need to come and defend yourself. No, it's on you. You, you, you. You understand what I mean? So if we are patient, let me tell you something. There is nothing that you want people to realize that eventually they will not realize. Nothing. Whether in this life or in the next one day they will recognize. And so why don't we just allow things to be so that we can be at peace. Jesus paid too much of a price for your peace than for you to let somebody bother you. So when they, when they prove to be difficult, you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit saying for you to do? 
And that is exactly what you need to do because there, there are too many miracles that are tied to your ability to be able to be at peace with other people than for you not to strive to be at peace with people. So it is not people that you're hurting. The Bible says it is the Lord that you're despising by being perverse in your ways. Let's learn to take the high road. You see, God wants to do great and mighty things amongst us. From the difficulties and the challenges that we have experienced in our individual lives of late, we already have the indicators that we need to anticipate a great time of refreshing. But for God to be able, for us to be able to enjoy, rather, all of the things that God has for us, we need to be at peace. We need to let go of every weight that so easily besets us. Because what God will do, He will do, but you do not want to be one who castles himself ahead of God's arrival. Look at Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus, but Peter denied Jesus. But guess what? Peter did not take himself too seriously. Many of us would have hung ourselves because we let the Lord Jesus down. That was what Judas did. He, let the, he, he felt like he had let the Lord down and he hung himself. What happened was Jesus was still raised from the dead regardless of people's behavior. You understand what I mean? People will always be people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 that many are the devices in the hearts of men, but the counsel of the Lord shall stand. If they don't like you, that doesn't mean God's not going to bless you. God already loves you. You know, God is in such a situation wherein he can't even change his mind about you because the Bible says he loves you with an everlasting love. And so if somebody doesn't like you, right, but God still loves you, then everything that God has commanded toward you, he commanded in, and because everything God commanded toward you, he commanded in his love, the will of God will still be done in your life regardless. So when you have that understanding, what people do to you will no longer bother you and hurt you as much because it doesn't really have an effect on your life. Unless you hold on to it and you don't allow the goodness and the mercy of God to keep moving you in the direction of the fulfillment of destiny. Many of us, the reason why we're not enjoying the fullness of what God has for us is because we're holding on to other people. And when those people remain in the past, guess what happens? You remain in the past too because your hands are not made out of rubber that can keep expanding. So you're holding on to the past, but you're moving into the future like one of those fake superheroes if you're holding on to things in the past you remain in the past so that is why we need to let go but before you let go do your best possible to make peace then on answering your call text them if they have blocked you talk to somebody else do it in such a way that you can say like Jesus says I have fulfilled all righteousness Jesus says pray for your enemies Bless them who persecute you because by so doing, you are even heaping a coal of fire upon them. You know how much it bothers people when they expect you to hate them in return, but you're loving them? Then it makes all of the animosity against you ineffective. You understand what I mean? There are times when the Holy Spirit led me to call some people and they will be like, well, that's unexpected. I'm like, well, that's, that is good. You understand what I mean? Because you think you've done enough for me do not want to come out to you. But I'm like, no, you can't keep me locked out because I need to come out. My blessings might be around you somewhere. You understand what I mean? Because Satan keeps using people against people. But what have we read in the book of Acts? What we read earlier in Acts 15, 22, that God is using people for people. The apostles and the ministers, the elders, they were the ones who kick-started the ministry of Paul and Silas and of Barnabas. Peter did not say, well, as you know, I'm the one that God's called to the Gentiles. No, when they saw the testimony and the, and, and the witness of Paul, what did they do? They also blessed him and sent him to the same Gentiles. That is how the ministry or, the, or that's how the kingdom of God advances when we recognize that we're brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. We're on the same team. So the way the devil operates is that he tries to use us one against another and by so doing we become ineffective. Why? The Bible says a kingdom divided against itself 
will not stand. When we were children, we used to sing this song at church. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. And together we will stand till he comes. You see, the beauty of that song is our pastor likes singing it just before he preaches. So if there are any two people who aren't talking to each other, before the word of God comes forth, they have to hold each other's hands. Because you have people like my brother, if he notices you're not holding the person next to you, he will come down and say, hold each other's hands. Because we recognize that when there is a break in transmission, it stops the power from flowing, period. And that is the reason why we need to make it our responsibility to ensure that there is peace amongst the brethren. When someone calls you to weigh in on a matter, Saying, well, I need to go talk to this brother, but I know he doesn't want to see me. Can you make time to come along with me? Don't say it's none of your business. It is as much your business as it is mine because once there is a disconnect, the power doesn't flow and we all get to suffer it. Have you not read in the Old Testament how often one person will commit a crime and everybody will suffer for it? And people say, well, that is the Old, Old Testament. And then you come into the New Testament. And you see that the same thing is still in operation. When you have one person, remember those people, Ananias and Sapphira. When they came, the judgment that came upon them delayed the salvation of many. Why? Because the Bible says people who were outside, they hurt and they were too afraid to come to the camp of the believers. That is the sin of some people and their judgment affecting other people. These guys were open to the public coming in and going out, receiving the gospel, giving their life, getting converted and becoming born again. But just that one incident soured the soup. But thank God for the Holy Spirit who continues to move men in the heart of forgiveness and love to overcome such limitations. But the bottom line is this. If I let's read 14 uh, what did we just read? 14.2. Let's read Proverbs chapter 7. And, and then you see how closely related they are. And then we just move on from there. Proverbs chapter 7 uh, verse 5. The Bible says that they may keep you from the immoral woman. From the seductress who flatters with the words. Let's read from, from verse 1. My son, keep, your, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live. And my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Now, this is where I want us to really focus. Verse 4 says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your nearest kin. That you may keep from the immoral woman. From the seductress who flatters with her words. You see, to be perverse in our ways means to choose our own path rather than operating in the path of wisdom. The Bible says that when you're not walking hand in hand with the wisdom of God as your nearest kin, as your sister, as someone that came out of the same source as you, you are bound to fall for the seductress. And I've told you before that when you read about the seductress in Proverbs, it's not just talking about some strange woman. It's not just talking about one person. The word seductress and the strange woman quite often in the book of Proverbs is used as a contrast between that other woman that is called the wisdom of God. So when you see the wisdom of God is out on the streets She's calling for her children, looking for the people that will pay attention. Subsequent to that, what did we have? We had, I mean, just before that time, what did we have? We had the strange woman looking for people to seduce. So it, don't think about it as just a woman sexually tempting men. Look at that woman as a spirit tempting people away from the way of God. Alrighty. And so because for many years, I read that just as, okay, but why is this guy talking repeatedly about a woman who is looking for a young man to tempt? But then the next thing he will talk about, he will talk about the wisdom of God. Also as a woman, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Is this a natural woman and a spiritual woman being compared? Or is this something else? 
And over the years, I've come to recognize that the seductress of Proverbs is typically talking about the spirit of temptation. Anything that draws you, seduces you from the way of God to be operating in your way should be avoided like a man avoids a temptress. Does it make sense? So the moment a thought comes to you, look at what it says here. It says the seductress flatters with her words. When someone wrongs you, there are thoughts that begin to emanate from within you, justifying why you should block them and cut them off. And it will flatter you. It will make you feel good with yourself. That all I have to do is I don't have to deal with this nonsense. I'm going to just cut you off. I'm going to cut you off like a bad line. That's what I'm going to do. And then those things appeal to you. But is that the wisdom of God? The wisdom, of, the wisdom of the world or the sense of the seductress says that if somebody wrongs you, you cut them off. You just don't talk to them again. But the word of God says, by godly wisdom, stick to make peace with them. You know when Jesus said, if someone has a, an ought against you, you should go to them. I'm like, Jesus, come on. Come on. They have an issue with me. I'm just living my life. I'm just being a happy camper. They are the ones with an issue. Let them deal with their issue. But you know, God has an expectation of you. And that expectation is that you will be holy as your heavenly father is holy. Imagine if God is like us. It's a terrible thing to imagine, but let's just imagine it for a second. Right? You created everything and then you bring man to a finished work. And all he has to do is just expand the work. He said to them, be fruitful, multiply. Even the process of doing your assignment is such a pleasurable process. He says, I've given to you every fruit. He gave you his glory. He's like, just knock yourselves out. You understand what I mean? And then that man that was giving everything blew it. If God was like us, he would have said, well, I can't do anything else for you. I've done everything, in fact. So if you blow it, you blow it. I ain't talking to you no more. I'm going to just go make myself another earth somewhere else. And I won't even call it earth so that it's not jinxed. I'm going to call it something else. Maybe I'll call it a planet. You see what I mean? Yeah. If you know, you know. But God did not do that. The Bible says that while we were enemies of God, Whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God came to us even though we are the ones who have an issue with him. But he came to us. And he says, I want you to do the same thing. Why is God asking us to take the high road? Because he knows that if you do not take the high road, the seductress is waiting for you just around the corner of the valley, the easy way out. And she's there telling you. And the Bible says the seductress said to the young man, oh, come into my room. My husband's traveled to a far country and he's not going to be back until the appointed day. And the Bible says this young man, out of the ignorance and the foolishness of his heart, decided to yield to the temptation of the seductress, not knowing that there was an arrow waiting to pierce even his internal organs to spill his liver because her way is the way of death and it leads to hell where many kings have gone. And we still think the Bible is talking about just one woman. No, the Bible is talking about any thought that seduces you away from the path of righteousness. Let us not approve of any behavior that does not glorify God. Let us not approve of any behavior that only satisfies your ego. Let us make sure that we renew the premium that we place upon every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need to live on the word of God as though it is the air that you breathe. Because the Bible says in that word of God is life and that life is your light. If I don't suck the life, I mean, if I don't suck on the word of God as though it is life to me, I am setting myself up to walk in darkness. The Lord is calling us to peace, to love, to forgiveness. He's calling us to take, he's calling us to a life of wisdom. A life that does things just because God says so. Because any other thing outside of thus saith the Lord, your emotions are speaking. 
Your background may be speaking. Your culture may be speaking. Your tradition may be speaking. But we cannot afford to be led by any other voice outside of the voice of God. Because all those other voices are just the seductress disguising herself in various ways just to lure you away from the path of righteousness. Let me say something very quickly here. And we're going to read a scripture from Genesis eleven seventeen. 17. So let's read that scripture first of all. Because there, is, there, there are certain things that the enemy has successfully arrayed against us. And you may be wondering, oh goodness, why did God make this world with so many enemies? Why do we have all these oppositions? Can't we just all sing Kumbaya all the time and be happy? The reason being that we we'll live on earth for just a couple of decades before we inherit eternal life. And so all the difficulties and the challenges that we'll go through here are the things that allow for us to have the right sense of appreciation for eternity. We are here going through all of these things. God is allowing Satan to run around seeking people out and devouring them. God allows the devil to do all of those things because without such trials and challenges, we will only be weaklings. We will never truly be strong children of God. So let's stop frowning. The Bible says rejoice in tribulations because quite often some of us are like, can't I just be like that person whose friends love him? Who, who is that person? I don't know who that person is. Unless he's a celebrity. And that is not real love. That is idol worship. You understand what I mean? Because you know a lot of celebrities, you want to be like them because everybody loves them everywhere they go to. Imagine Denzel walking into this place now. Everyone's going to be like, oh, you know, maybe everybody wants an autograph on their face and all that good stuff. Not, not in this place. I mean, we're saved here. Here, our worship is reserved only for God. We don't worship idols. We don't idolize people. You understand what I mean? But I'm just saying in, in, uh, in some unbelieving place somewhere. And, 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 and Denzel will be feeling love because everybody, you know, like I was telling you a couple of weeks ago, this idol worship that is the celebrity culture, it's not good for anybody. Not even for the people that are being worshipped. Because it destroys men. When you put men in the position of God, they cannot stand. They don't have what it takes. And that is the reason why some of them don't know how to manage their own ego anymore. Simply because their ego has been inflated by people worshipping them. So they don't even really know who loves them anymore. Simply because everything that looks like love is being presented to them all in the name of being celebrated. So quite often, we compare ourselves to certain people whose trials have not started. You know, there are certain people, you look at them and you're like, man, God, God, God. I mean, you could just photocopy that guy and make me him. I don't even mind having a social security number. His credit score will look good on me. If I don't want to live on the street that he lives in, you know, I've seen his wife, and she only says one word every other week. You know, and you start to be envious of all these fantasies. But what if he's waiting in line to begin his own trials? You do not know. Do you know how many people wanted to be Job before his temptation came? The Bible says that Job was the wealthiest man in the East. His children were friends. The Bible says they took turns going from one person's house to the other, having parties. His children were so close and they partied so hard. The Bible says that Job actually would spend time fasting for his children so that they don't enjoy life too much and forget God. You know that was the reason why he fasted? The Bible did not say Job fasted because he loved God. He fasted because he was afraid his children did not know reality. You understand what I mean? His children were shielded from reality because this man was established. Everything that they laid his hands on was prosperous. The guy was a good guy. Everybody wanted to be like Job. But that was because his trial didn't come. And the moment his trial came, even if his wife was like, uh, see you later. Yeah, for better, for later. You see what I mean? You see, but we need to recognize that it is not the grand design of God for us to live lives that are void of challenges. 
Solomon said God placed man in Ecclesiastes under the sun, chapter 2, that he may be exercised. We are here to be tested and to be tried. And so when people are being difficult and when people tell lies on you, when people insult your intelligence, when they want to take advantage of you, rather than complaining, say, blessed be the name of the Lord. At least God is using people and not demons. Even though some of those people are demon possessed. But you wouldn't want to be chased around by a cyclone. You don't want to be chased around by a dragon that is smelling like garbage. You see what I mean? I would still rather take a human being that kind of looks like me, just not as nice. You understand what I mean? There are so many things that could be used to tempt a man, and God still allows for us to be tempted by other people. We don't even know how privileged we are. You understand what I mean? Even though that's what makes it painful sometimes, you know, because if a dog barks at you, you don't mind. It's a dog. When a person barks at you because you have an expectation, then you take offense. And Jesus says, offenses will not but come, but happy is he who is not offended for my sake. You don't want to be depressed? Don't be offended. You want to be happy all the time? Don't be offended. Jesus told us happy is he who is not offended. You see, you see the reason why many people are sad in the world today is because, you know, in the past, you could go for like a whole week and nobody will offend you. Because you go to the office and the people at work have exhausted all of their arrows that they can fire at you. They know you're crazy. So they don't even come near your cubicle anymore. When they open the fridge in the break room, they know that this is where Agnes keeps her milk. Nobody goes near her. Agnes claims to be born again, but she's crazy. So you can go to work for mon from Monday through Friday and nobody bothers you because your work people avoid you like a plague. But these days of the internet, you can barely go seven minutes before you see someone's comment that offends you. The other day somebody was telling me, is this like a human being or demons are on the internet now? I said, well, it's a human finger, but it might be a demonic thought. You understand what I mean? You see, we have come to such a time that the world is so connected, we're so exposed to each other that the rate of offense has gone up and that is the reason why the rate of depression and sadness has gone up too because people are taking offenses everywhere. You take offenses at people's political stand. You take offenses at the fact that they did sales and they didn't tell you. You, you take offenses at all kinds of things. The other day, somebody was really angry that the car that he just bought, there was a recall on it. And he was like, look at the date on the recall. They should have said something. I bought the car after that date. I'm like, okay, go and make your own. You know, because people just want to get angry at all kinds of things. Is the car broken down? No, but they should have told me. Why should they have told you? Are you that important? To God you are, but to these people, they don't care. You're just another payer. Another customer. So get off your high horse and stop being offended at every little thing. You see, the things that God tells us to do, they are for us, not for him. The Bible says he who sits in the heavens, he laughs. God is there all day having a book because he has already seen everything. You can't surprise him. You can't. If you can surprise God, I'll, I'll be happy to see what it is that you would do that someone hasn't already done. I'm saying that again. <laughs> oh, God's seen a lot of that. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 17. Let's take a quick look at this. And I'm going to tell us a little bit more about where we're going with all of this. Matthew, I mean, Genesis 11, 17. The Bible says here that after he begot the leg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ryu. After he begot Ryu, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Ryu lived 32 years and begot Sirog. And after he begot Sirog, Ryu lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. What have you noticed? The more they had children, the less they lived. Uh-huh. Let me tell you something. You can keep reading those genealogies. The more they had children. Now, I'm not discouraging people from giving birth to children here. The Bible says, be fruitful and multiply. 
So that's not where we're going with this. But the reality of it was this. The more there were people on earth, the less people were living. Because every new person that gets added to the population comes with their own trouble. They shorten the lives of people with all their trouble. But there is a solution to that. The solution to that is this. If you choose to let people struggle, trouble you, you are shortening your own life. They can do whatever they want to do. I will not be offended. You see, because you still have every right in the world by God to choose how you feel about what people do. You know, Ryan can do the same thing to myself and Rosemary, and I will feel in a way that is different from how Rosemary feels. But he did the same thing. But we chose to feel different about it because we are in control of how we feel. And someone says, oh, Brother Moses, some things really hurt. I know. Some things really hurt. Have you ever seen someone with a tattoo? That really hurts. But they took it, and they're happy about it. And they take pictures and put it online. Look at my new tattoo. But that thing was very painful. But they have decided to take it as a thing of joy. So things can hurt in the natural. But what you make of it is still dependent on your heart posture. You understand what I'm saying? You see, we, we can keep making excuses all day for how people behave and what they do. Oh, they, I've heard people say things like this. Oh, no one's ever done that to you. That's why you're talking like that. If anyone's ever done that to you. So I usually like for people to finish. And then I bring out my journal. Spring of 86, four people did that thing. <laughs> and I'm still here. You understand what I mean? Oh, the one that happened recently, somebody came to me to talk to me about certain things that somebody was saying about them. I said, is that all they said about you? <laughs> and she was like, maybe you didn't hear what I said. So I repeated what she said. He said, yeah, isn't that terrible? I said, okay, sit down. Let me, let me enlighten you. So when I started telling her, she was like, um, actually, maybe it's not that bad after all. I said, no, it's not even maybe it's not that bad. You see, because we have the talent of making mountains out of more hills. You talk to a lot of people who are divorced. If they're going to be honest with themselves, after they got divorced, they met people who had gone through worse things and are still married and somehow overcame, mature, and now they're happier. And people are like, oh my God, yeah, my ex wasn't even that bad. You see, but why was it that bad at that time? Because of what you made of it. I'm not saying to make light of people's actions. I'm not saying to let people get away with crazy. Or maybe I am. Because the reality is God lets us get away with a lot of crazy. Do you know how much crazy God lets us get away with? Oh yeah. And you know what God wants? He wants you to just pass it on. I let you get away with crazy. You let him get away with crazy. And by so doing, crazy is not registered amongst us because we just let it in through one window and it's out through the window and then we can live happily ever after. You understand what I'm saying? And that is how it works. But if God lets you get away with it, but you're like, okay, now, God, thank you, because you are God, you can do that. But I am a man. I'm not going to let them go. And God is like, well, the reality of it is I made you in my image and I will not have an expectation of you that I have not equipped you for. God has equipped us for everything that he's commanded us to do in his word. Jesus was being nailed to the cross. His side was being pierced. He was being given vinegar instead of water. What did he say while he was on that cross? He says, Father, forgive them, but they do not know what they do. Including the guys who got paid. To be there. They knew what they were doing. At least from my perspective. But from God's perspective. They did not know. Because if they know the totality. Oh let me tell you something. There are friends that you have lost. Simply because you did not know the future God has for them. There are people that you've walked away from in your life because you did not know that God sent them to make you strong. You're supposed to be embracing them and loving on them for helping to partner with God to test you so that you can grow. So if we truly know what God has for us 
and we truly know what God has for people, we will not take offense every now and again. Let me give you another example. This happened to Jesus. You know, Jesus had a forerunner, his cousin John. You know, when John was born, John's only mission in life was not to go to school and graduate. His only mission was to be the forerunner of Jesus, period. In Micah, I believe chapter 4, verse 6, thereabouts, the Bible says that before the Messiah comes, Elijah must come to prepare the way by turning the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons back to the fathers. Elijah was supposed to come and he came as John the Baptist because Jesus told his disciples, if he have the heart to receive him, I say to you that he was Elias that was to come which is the name Elijah. And when John the Baptist came, baptizing men in the Jordan, if you've ever seen pictures of the Jordan, it's not the prettiest place to baptize. I can't even swim in it. In fact, I can't even take a selfie in the Jordan. That's how ugly it looks. But that was his life, his work. He was in the Jordan, baptizing people day and night. He was there, like a wild man. And this same Jesus that you came your entire life to live for, when he started his ministry, you got arrested. He couldn't even send you a postcard. Do you know that when, Jesus, when John was locked up, Jesus didn't go to see him? Now think about it for a second. If everything that I exist to do is to help you, and now I'm in trouble, and you can't even send me a text message, I will be offended. Most people get offended. John who was anointed by God. You know, John's anointing was already active before he was born. Because when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, and Mary visited after she had received the word of the Lord from angel Gabriel. You know, as soon as the word of the Lord came from angel Gabriel, and she said, be it unto me according to your word, the Bible says she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and she was found with child. Jesus was probably still a couple of weeks old in Mary's womb. And John, the Bible says, when Mary came into the room, he felt from afar off, the baby in the womb of Elizabeth started to move. That is the anointing. A six-month-old baby did not even have the physical consciousness to be able to react to what's going on outside. But John moved, and that was how anointed this dude was. Jesus said concerning John, he said, of all children born of women, none is greater than John until now. Everybody, including Enoch, the one who walked with God so much so that they appointed him from the earth to sit in the courts of the angels and be an administrator over heavenly beings while he was on earth. The same Enoch that heaven needed him so badly, they sent a horse to come and pick him up. They said, what you've done with men is enough. We need you more here. Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. Enoch was there. Abraham was there. Noah was there. Daniel was there. Job was there. David was there. And Jesus says, none of those people compares to John. He says, there's no one greater than this one. So that same John can be offended. So don't feel bad if you get offended. Just don't stay in offense. You understand what I mean? And so John was put in prison. So he sent his disciples to Jesus. He was like, Maybe I'm missing something here. He said, go and ask that fellow, that cousin of mine. He, at that particular point in time, he didn't even call him the Messiah anymore. When he saw Jesus come to get baptized, what did he say? He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But when he was offended, he was like, go and tell that dude. That guy. You see, you see what happens? The same people that used to call you darling, then they start calling you all kinds of names afterwards. They say, go and tell that. Yeah. You see what I mean? So don't feel special. It happened to Jesus. Even Jesus was, was disregarded. And so guess what happened? He sent messengers to Jesus to say, Jesus, are you the one or are we to expect another? Because at this particular point in time, I don't even believe in your ministry anymore. Oops. Yeah. The same people that will come and say, Pastor, can you please pray for me? And then they get offended. And then the next thing, they're like, oh, that guy is operating by African voodoo. 
I'm like, wow, really? Because you got offended? God changed his mind? I remember when you came here the other day, crying and snorting. The devil was chasing you around and flinging you back and forth like a rag doll. You came here and we laid hands on you by the anointing. We prayed for you and prophesied by the revelation of the Holy Ghost. And you were set free and your broken ankle was mended. At that particular point in time, it was in voodoo. But the moment you got offended, oh, he's not called by God. He's operating by African voodoo. Let me tell you something. Every idle word that men speak, they will give an account of. The Lord said in his word, do not think evil of anybody. To the pure, all things are pure. But when you allow offense, it taints your judgment and corrupts your vision. And it allows for you to say things that despise the Lord. You know, the other day I laughed. I saw a person trying to torment me in the dream. And I laughed. I said, I remember when this woman came to me. Someone invited her to her house group. And I prophesied over pretty much everybody in the room, like all 90 of them. And after the meeting, she was like, we have never seen a thing like this. She was like, man of God, the Lord brought me here. This is where he wants me to be. And in fact, he wants you to do more than prophesy. He wants you to also preach and teach. Because we need to learn how to prophesy like him. I was like, hmm, praise God. You know, the Bible says, Jesus... <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in their hearts. This same person, after a while, because she got offended, guess what happens? Now I was no longer anointed. I was no longer a prophet. I was no longer sent from God. I am now a voodoo <laughs> practitioner, yeah, sent from Nigeria by my ancestors. I'm like, wow, that was quick. And all of that happened within like three weeks. I'm like, man. That was why Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Because Jesus knows how quickly people can flip flop and turn their backs on you. Oh yeah, the same John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the Bible says he was boasting to Andrew and Peter. And he was saying, we have, we, that's him. That's, that's the name of God right there. And in case you don't know, he my cousin. That my mom told me that when I was only six months in the womb, I was already dancing in the Holy Ghost when Jesus was singing worship. You know, that was the same John who turned on Jesus and he says, are you the one or should we expect another? He no longer believed in the ministry of Jesus. He no longer, he started to question if he was the same Jesus that was the Lamb of God. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus said to the same disciples, he says, what do you see? You see the blind, their eyes are open. You see the lame, they are walking. So this is what I tell my wife whenever anybody wants to bother my wife with all this talk, I will say to her, just remember that we're still here. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will see him through all of them. I always tell, I always remind my wife, I said, look, as long as I'm still here and I'm still bearing fruits and my children are giving glory to God and one more person is getting blessed, it doesn't matter what anybody says. I'm a fruit-bearing believer. They may not like me. They may not approve of me, but I'm already accepted in the beloved. And that was what Jesus told those people. He says, the blind see, the lame walk, and the deaf can hear the gospel. Go and tell John that happy is he who is not offended for my sake. Jesus says, offenses will not but come, but happy is he who is not offended for my sake. The Lord is raising me up today to stand before you that we need to clean up the house because the fire is coming. God is bringing the power that we've been waiting for. Our light is come. And that is the reason why there cannot be any one of those saints named amongst us. The Bible says, let these things not be named amongst you that is found in the company of the Gentiles. And that is the reason why we cannot allow malice keeping. We cannot allow anything to keep us away from receiving the power. I'm talking about real power. You know, when the Holy Spirit came, the Bible told us two conditions that were fulfilled or two of the conditions that were fulfilled before the Holy Spirit could come. Acts chapter two, the Bible says what? 
when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the day came, and the Bible goes on to say that they were all together in one place and in one accord. And then the Holy Spirit came. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to come while we're yet to be in one accord. Because when there is a loose connection, there will be a spark. Have you tried plugging something into the wall and there's a loose connection? What happens? There's a spark and the spark blows the fuse and the entire house is thrown into darkness. And God does not want you to blow the fuse of heaven. So that is the reason why he needs for us to put away these things so that we can truly be in one accord. Men and brethren, settling disputes by godly wisdom. Remember what we read in Acts chapter 15, verse 7. The Bible says, when Peter invited them to settle all disputes, he called them men and brethren. Don't forget, we're brothers first of all. We're family first of all before anything else. We're not competitors. We're family. Because the moment we know that, then we're not going to give in to this doctrine who is telling us to only look after our own feelings, our own ego. Any one of us who is going to be a soldier of the cross must first of all die to self. Jesus says, whoever must follow me must be ready to take up their cross. Your cross is not for crucifying Canada. Your cross is for crucifying you. But you know how we want to put other people on the cross. Like, you see that man, my leader? She needs some Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is like, yeah, yeah, she does. But you need me more. <laughs> because there's a speck in her eyes. But I see the log in yours. Yeah, Holy Spirit, give me a break. Do her first. And the Holy Spirit is like, well, you had your chance. I'm moving on. I'm going. I'm going. Gone. You understand what I mean? You see, where we're at right now is where we need to eagerly anticipate the power. And for us to receive the power, we need to ensure that there are no loose ends and that we are not even the loose end. You understand what I mean? Because at the end of the day, when God is ready, when the day of Pentecost fully comes and God cannot wait anymore, he will be the one by himself to remove the loose ends. Because what God will do, he will do. Remember how many people were supposed to wait for Jesus? How many people were supposed to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit? 500. Well, come on. Where are my Bible scholars here? In Acts chapter 1, the Bible says there were what? 500 people that went to watch Jesus get taken up into the heavens. 500 men went to see Jesus taken up. And Jesus told all 500 of them, he says, you go and wait for me in Jerusalem. If you read the old King James, you will know the difference between you plural and you singular. Okay, if you haven't observed it, let me just help you out. When you see the word thou, anything that starts with the T or TH, thou, thee, it refers to one person. Anything that starts with a Y, the ye refers to everybody. That was why in John chapter 3, verse 3, I believe, when Nicodemus came to Jesus and he says to Jesus, what must I do to be born again? Jesus said to him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, even though I'm talking to you, he says, ye must be born again. I'm saying to you that all of you must be born again. So when Jesus told them to go and wait for the power, he was talking to all of them. So we know without a doubt that he was talking to all 500 of them. He didn't say Peter, James, and John. He says all of them should go because the expression he used was a plural term to, to, to describe all of them. And he says, go and wait for me in Jerusalem until you have received the power. And the angels of the Lord, the men in white linen, they stood there after the man's mouth could not close. They were, God, oh, Jesus is God. They were there and they said to him, don't just open your mouth here like broken doors. Get up and go and do what he says. So not only did Jesus tell them, those angels also bore witness. And Jesus made it very clear what they must do to go and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And the day of Pentecost, how many people were left? Not half. Less than a quarter of the people, if my math is correct. 120 people were, were, were there on the day of Pentecost. But there were 500 registered candidates. They had to register. Because the Bible says, and the number of the names of them that were found in the upper room. So there was a number of names because they would come in and they would check the register. 
between Ascension and Pentecost was but a few weeks, and these men were already lost. Why? Because God would rather bring the power when it was due than delay, hoping that some would repent. He gave them plenty of time, and they failed to repent. And Jesus already told us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. When Jesus comes, people would have time to repent, but several people would still choose not to repent, and the door of the ark will be shut. And so the call tonight to repentance, to taking the high road, to choosing love, and to choosing mercy over judgment is a call that God is making out of love so that you are not removed from those that experience the power when it comes. You know why God removes people before the power comes? Because he loves them. Because when the power comes and they're not ready, they die like Ananias and so I want to encourage you today, make a renewed commitment in your heart. Do not despise the Lord. Do not give in to the word of the seductress that is telling you to do things that will just make you feel good. The voice of the seductress is the voice of temptation, telling you to look after yourself alone. You can't talk to that lady because she insulted you the last time. She's going to do it again. Any voice that is telling you to go after pleasure and self-preservation is not of God. Self-preservation has become such an enemy in the body of Christ today, wherein people are always thinking about how they feel. People no longer correct one another because if you try to correct somebody, you're afraid that they're going to tell you off, that they won't receive it well, so you keep it to yourself. Watching your brothers and sisters go into the pit of hell. They are going into trouble and you know people are like, I don't want anyone to insult me. No, the Bible says open rebuke is better than love that is carefully consumed. Do you know that there are times that my wife, see this is my angelic wife that is right here. There are certain times that I know certain things to say to correct her, but I know that she would first of all bring a fight. But I would still say it anyway because that five minutes of being told off, you understand what I mean? Let me give you an example. It happened just today. Yeah, I would feel better after saying this. I'm just kidding. My wife left the garage door open. We have another garage to the side, right? We kind of use it as a storage. And sometimes when the weather is warm, because it's under a shaded place, snakes will come there because it's kind of like the perfect temperature. Don't be afraid. It happened only one time. So don't say you're not coming to our house again, okay? <laughs> right? Say that again. So I, I saw a snake there once before. So since then, I've always told people around, when the weather is warm, don't leave the garage door open, right? And so as soon as I was driving in, I saw that garage to the side. I saw the doors open. I'm like, okay, the temperature is getting warm now, so I need to say something. And a voice within me said, you know how that's going to go. Because I, I rehearsed it in my brain. My wife is going to be like, how many times do I do that? Because I just forgot. Anybody can forget anything. You know, so I knew that was going to happen. And guess what? I was like, I am going to be bold in the Lord. So I came in and I said, uh, you know, the weather is getting warm. So let's be intentional about clocking that garage all the time. Because we don't want any reptiles in there. And the next thing she said was, I forgot. Anybody can forget. Just the way that I rehearsed it. You see, when God has given you the gift of premonition, use it for your own peace. We all have that gift of being able to predict what people will say and do. And that is the reason why we're afraid to tell them the truth. You start not to be afraid, but to prepare yourself. When I was a baby husband, I would have gotten angry. I'm trying to protect everybody. I went out to buy you stuff. And this is how you welcome me. No, because I have learned now not to be foolish. So what did I do? I kept quiet. I went to the back of the house. I laughed at myself for like two minutes and came back inside. I was like, you see, I told you you were going to get told off. I said, yes, I know, but I still told the truth. You understand what I mean? And so I came back. The food that I went to get for her was still sitting on the, on the counter. I'm like, oh, she's really mad now. So I was like, you know what I was saying was like, she said, what were you saying? I said, no. I said, even I forget. So I was just telling us, all of us, that that we need to be intentional. And she was like, yeah, maybe you should have said it like that or something. Where's the food? I'm like, yes, praise the Lord. The morale of the story is this. Let's not be intimidated by perceived outcomes. 
of doing what God says. Let us be bold and damn the consequence. Walk on yourself before you try to walk on anybody. Before I said what I said, I already walked on myself. I told myself, put on the old arm. Because you're going to need it. You understand what I mean? But you know what we do? Instead of putting on the whole armor of God so that we can pursue love, we put on the whole armor of God. Sister Shannon, I'm getting ready to call you. So if you can be back in two minutes, that would be great. So if you, anyway, I don't even know where I'm going with that, but I'm going home. Praise the Lord. God is good. So here is the deal. Let us pursue love. Let us learn to crucify ourselves. If we are all dead to self, ego goes with that. And then you can do the work of loving other people. And whatever they do in return doesn't trigger your flesh. It triggers your compassion. You understand what I mean? Because the flesh that is already crucified cannot be excited. And if we can just live like that, we will help each other go out there to do the work. Remember the second verse of scripture that we read today from Acts chapter 15. People like Paul, Barnabas, Silas. I didn't say this, but let me say it now. You know, I laughed about Barnabas. We had so many names, right? Do you know that many of us are like that? We have come to assume several identities, different places because of how life has treated us. But even people like that can still do the work of God if they have the right support from their brethren. So it doesn't matter who that person is, how unstable they may have been, how traumatized they may have been, every single person can still do the work of the evangelist if we will partner with God in celebrating them, in honoring them, and making sure that we settle disputes as brothers and sisters. Because the power is coming. I'm excited to do this next thing. You see, praise the Lord. Lately, we've been having testimonies after testimonies. Right? And I'm excited, you know, because the Lord already gave us that indicator, right? That we are going into a season of testimonies. How many people remember that from a couple of weeks ago? And now we've been having awesome, awesome testimonies. You know, the testimony that I shared with you about, you know, the breakthrough that we had um, in one of our businesses overseas, you know, and, and we've seen Sister Z, the miracle of healing. I was chatting, um, with my sister Vanessa earlier, and she was also talking about the divine intervention of God in her health. And I'm just so delighted because the word of the Lord is true. God said it, that we will enjoy it, and we are enjoying it. And so, before we break bread today, I'm going to call on Shannon, our sister Shannon. She has a testimony. I'm going to pre preface that testimony before she comes on. Alan, please help me grab that microphone for her. Uh, on Tuesday, two Tuesdays ago, not two, actually, it was just Tuesday last week, right? She had come to me, and I knew she was going to come. I could see that there was a need. And she came and she was like, I, I would like for you to pray with me. I have some pain in my body. And the, and the moment she was coming close, the Holy Spirit said to me, do nothing today, but make an appointment. So I said to her, can you come on Saturday? I would love to pray with you. And so she came on Saturday and I still didn't pray with her. I was busy doing what I do. And then after the meeting, she just came and she was like, today's Saturday, you're going to pray for me. She wasn't even standing upright. And then when that appointment came, we saw God's intervention. And now I'm going to just turn it over to her for her to tell you exactly what she has experienced of the goodness of God. Sister Shannon. Praise the Lord. On March 21st, I got to a fight with a rooster, and he won. <laughs> and I ended up having two broken vertebrae in my lower back at L1 and L3. They told me no bending, no jumping, no twisting, no lifting, having anything over 10 pounds, and that I was supposed to be down off and on for up to three months. Well, as he said, he prayed over me Saturday and. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. God is good. Praise God. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. God is good. 
God is good. <laughs> you know, after I prayed for her, I said, I, I said, how are you? She was like, can't you see? I'm standing upright. Because when she came, this was how she came to the other side. And when she walked away, she was like, look at me, I'm standing upright. And then her daughter, when she saw me today, the first thing that she said to me, I was trying to say hello to her. She was like, I think the oil works. Yeah. I mean, don't you wish that you knew that when you were only 14 years old? Because Lizzie's only 14, right? 15. And now she knows that the oil works. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. And so I want to encourage you, no matter what it is that you have put before the Lord, keep on believing. You see, because when God gives his word, the Bible says God watches over every word of his to perform it. He will do it. Yours may not have happened just yet, and it may not even happen like hers happened. But one thing that I can guarantee you is this, every word of God is worth holding on to, and he will do it. So we're going to close now just because of Chris's sake, because I don't want him to think this is how we're here forever. So we're going to close. I'm going to save some other things for you for later. Let us open our Bibles. We're still breaking bread from, from, I said from communion. As soon as I wanted to say from Isaiah, the Lord said to me, no, remember Matthew. So we're going to go to Matthew today. Matthew uh, chapter 17. If I could read two verses, one from 17 and one from 19. Um, okay. But again, if we're going to be doing it for time's sake, let's go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Um, we're going to read from verse 17. Actually, let's first of all read 11. And look at what it says in Matthew 19, 11. This was Jesus speaking. The Bible says, but he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. Whatever Jesus wanted to say there, Jesus was like, this is not for everybody. He says, it's only for those to whom it has been given. And so here is the deal. There are certain things that God is saying to his church, to his body, to the ecclesia today. And it is only going to be perceived and received by those to whom it has been given. Now, let me tell you something. The word of God is who? Jesus. The Bible says to us, a child is born and to us, a son is given. When the son of God gets giving, not everybody receives him. Anybody who receives him receives the fullness of the Godhead. So how much of what God is saying to his people today, your spirit gets to pick up on for your own strengthening, for your own equipping, and for your own peace depends on how much of Jesus you have received. So as we receive the body and the blood of Jesus today, you know when Jesus broke the bread and the wine, he says this bread is no longer just bread. It is my body. This wine is my blood. If you eat of this, you have a part in me. You are eating a part of me into you. So that's why he said as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remember, remembrance of me. So I don't want you to just break bread today as one of those things we do at communion house, you know? The name is communion house, so they have to break bread, I guess. No, don't do it like that. Do it today as a way of telling yourself you need more and more of Jesus. Because when you have received the son, then every other precious word is for you. He says, what I'm about to say is not for everybody except the ones to whom it's given. And what was given? The son was given. And who is the son? The Lord Jesus. And so when you partake of the Lord Jesus, you will hear the Lord by his Holy Spirit more clearly. The Bible says, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. There's a lot of things that God is saying to me lately and sometimes I'm, look, I'm looking around and I'm like, can other people not hear that? Can they not hear that? God wants you to hear everything. So as we break bread today, what you're doing is you're tuning your radio to the frequency of the Holy Spirit. And that frequency needs to resonate with something on the inside of you, and that is Jesus. So I want you to say to yourself today as you're breaking bread, 
I am receiving more of Jesus into me. And now I will hear more of the Father by the Holy Spirit. Because what is being said resonates with what's been given. So I will receive life from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Because the bread of life is already on my inside. In Jesus' name. I want to encourage you. Everybody, I want you to listen very closely. It doesn't matter where you've been and how far you have gone. You are God's child and he loves you. And he wants to use you. So when somebody comes to you and they have a problem, don't be wishing you could refer them to somebody else. Oh, I wish this was on Tuesday. I could have asked uh, Sister Manuel Lida to pray for this person. Even you pray. At that job, pray. For that neighbor, pray. Because God is going to use you if you believe that you are his. You may not have prayed for two minutes in the last two years. But all of that is just a belief away. Believe that it is not you, but him that is at work in you. Don't let any situation intimidate you. That person at work that says she's just been diagnosed with cancer. You don't have to be Benny Hinn or somebody whose name's been heard on TV and whose books are selling on Amazon to pray. Jesus says these signs will follow them that believe. All you need to do is believe. There is no sacrifice that has not been made. There's no sacrifice required that has not been made. Jesus took it all. So I want to encourage you. You know, I want to encourage you. Pray, wield the authority of heaven. You know, my brother Chris, I was seeking the Lord concerning you as I was getting close to the end of that message because I just like to do that sometimes. I like to give my friends a special gift. And that was what the Lord said to me, to say to you, nothing else matters but the fact that Jesus knows that you know him and you love him. He knows you and he loves you. Just declare that word, believing in your heart, and those mountains will move no matter what they are. In the lives of other people, they will move. In your own path, they will move. Because all it takes, you already have. And that is confidence in God. And so lastly, we're just going to still read that Matthew 17. Because I just realized now that Chris is not in a hurry. So let's read Matthew 17. And we're going to read just one verse of scripture. As we receive the Lord's body into ours. For effectiveness and ministry. For inquisitiveness. And for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Ears were open in this place today to hear what the Lord is saying unto the church. And Jordan, it's time to go back and go deep into the Old Testament. It is no longer going to be as mysterious as it's always been, simply because there is grace to hear. You see what I mean? It's time to get back in there. In fact, even you will begin to teach from the Old Testament. You know, can you imagine teaching from the book of Leviticus? And just having a revelation that is hot of the press. That is the season that we are in. You understand what I mean? Jesus said to me to say to you today by the Holy Spirit, that you will baptize them in the Holy Ghost. You will baptize them in the Holy Ghost. You will have casual conversations, casual, seemingly, but they will come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. Chris, from here, it is upward. It is upward in the mighty name of Jesus. It is upward. It is upward. I see you climbing with all, on all fours. Your hands and your legs, you're climbing, and eventually your hands were just waving to Jesus, and you're still going higher. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Okay, Matthew chapter 17, verse 19. The Bible says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said to him, Why could we not cast it out? They came to him privately. So I want to encourage you, if there's anything that has evaded you, that has eluded you, that has left you feeling like you're unable, go to Jesus privately. It could be a task at job. It could be a difficult spouse. It could be a troublesome child. Go to Jesus privately. And tell Jesus, I've been trying to fix this on my own. Why can't I do it? I'm not just saying Jesus do it. I want it to be a learning moment. You know, because Jesus is rabbi. He wants to teach. So he likes it when you come with a question. You will get his attention. He doesn't just want to give you fish. He wants to teach you how to fish. And so sometimes when it seems like God is not responding to you, ask him a question. Bring him into his element. And then suddenly, it's like you will feel the presence of God just saturate your room. You know, one of the things that I've learned to do again and again is to engage Jesus as the rabbi. You know, because he wants to teach. You know, he wants to tell you stuff. You know, but if you just go to him as, as the giver, 
You know, sometimes it's just like, man, I want to give you more precious stuff than you keep begging for. So go for the good stuff. Ask him. Anyway, praise the Lord. As we receive the body of the Lord Jesus today, we receive him, the Lord. We receive him into our hearts in greater measures, not just as Savior, but as Lord. We receive him with a heart of submissiveness to his will. And we say, Lord, not our will, but yours be done. As you are, so are we, ready to lay down our lives for the will of the Father, at all times and in all things. And Lord, we will not be offended, because happy is he who is not offended for your sake, even though offenses do come. In Jesus' name, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. I just want us to quickly say a word of prayer for Ryan. I just pray that as he's gotten up and left, that he will be received by the Lord. That's what I see. I see him as he's going. I see the Lord meeting him along the way. So Ryan, I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus. First of all, a prayer of thanksgiving, thanking God for this holy encounter that Jesus has for you. And that encounter will be one that is with you to take to places as a witness of the cross in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let me just say this. I want to pray for somebody today. You don't have to tell us who it is, but there is somebody in your life that has proven difficult. You is, they become like a rock. You can't even just get them to move. Things that make sense to you that are so simple and so obvious. It could be a boss at work. It could be a client. It could be a sibling. It could be a spouse. You don't have to tell us. But I want to pray with you today for the grace to see the hand of God melt the heart of stone. The Bible says in Ezekiel, God himself speaking, 36, 26. He says, I am the one that turns the heart of stone into flesh. A heart is meant to be made of flesh that beats, not a stone. That is immovable. And so if that is you today, I will describe to you what the Holy Spirit is revealing to me and it is a mighty sword. And that sword has the ability to separate death from life. So those ones that have been plagued by stolidness and insensitivity and hopelessness, that have been plagued by the spirit of death whose hearts are not beating with the life and the love of God. This mighty sword of divine intervention will separate every darkness from the light of God's love and power in the mighty name of Jesus. So I want you to come close to me. Just give me your right hand. Place in this right hand the day that which the Lord has revealed to me by the hand of the angel of the Lord, the sword of severance that separates darkness from light in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise because there will be an awesome testimony testimony of a shift in heart, a testimony of great responsiveness. This very moment is also a very good moment for you to lay your hands on yourself. If there be any pain, if there be any infirmity, you can hear again and again of the healing miracles that are going on and taking place in this place. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to come. We're going to pray a prayer of reactivation. You see, this person, needs to have a reactivation of the Spirit of God on the inside of them. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to open your palm that by the Holy Spirit has come forth the Word of God and by that angel on assignment today I placed upon your, upon your hand the sword of deliverance. It is called the sword of severance. I keep hearing open your palm to receive it. I said, it's been placed upon your hand today. You go from here, Olivia, in the mighty name of Jesus. To do the work of deliverance. Every rigidity. Every heaviness. Every kind of glue that holds the feet of the other to the ground. Is being dealt with today. Is being loosened in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive that sword in the name of Jesus. You will testify and it's going to be an awesome testimony. Hallelujah. 
So let me tell you something. The one that you stand for is in a vehicle and it needs to come out of that vehicle in order for him to go in the direction of his destiny. So Lord, in the matter of the name of Jesus, let there be a fire in that other vehicle as an indication to him and help by God for him to know he needs to alight from that vehicle quickly and move and go where you have situated him. You see, vehicles represent relationships, represent partnerships and alliances. And when we are in the wrong company, we head in the wrong direction. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as you, as, re as you have revealed, so shall it obtain. And we will have a testimony of great deliverance. Woman of God, in the mighty name of Jesus, patiently wait to receive that which the Lord has given to you. The one that the Lord has given to you is yours. Any other attempt by the enemy to bring disobedience of heart or rigidity of spirit is terminated today in here by the word of the Lord. The Lord is raising up a mighty army like a dynamite. God is doing a great work amongst us and I want you to tap into it, hold on to it very seriously. Jordan, come and stand in for your daddy here today. I want to pray for your dad today. I want to pray for your dad today. The Lord revealed to me that he is quickening his steps onto righteousness. There are times when it takes him longer to get to peace when certain thoughts come to his mind. So please come here. So from now on, in the mighty name of Jesus, whatever it is from the past or from afar that troubles him, even though he gets to manage it, it takes him a while. But from here onwards, very quickly, his steps will be quickened in righteousness unto peace and unto joy. So Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this one comes here today to receive a gift for another. Father, we thank you because all of our brethren will partake of what you are doing amongst us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. So every thought that lingers that is not of God will be blown out very quickly by the wind of peace in the process of righteousness and restoration in the name of Jesus. It is well with your old man in Jesus' name. God is good. You may go. Where is Anita? Anita, the Lord has given you the anointing. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing, give me the, you, you, you already know. Oh, yes. The anointing breaks the yoke. You can sit down again once the oil comes back. I'm going to pray for you some more. All righty. So you remember, we have people who have been difficult, and that's why we're here, right? God is good. All righty. So I need that. That was quick. Yeah. I forgot that it was Alan. Alan is as quick as a. Yeah. Father, we thank you because we know no other one but you. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord, and there is no other. And then I want you to stretch forth your hand. Okay, before you do that, I want you to step back a little. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you because in here today, your love is active. Your love is strong. And in your love, you have chosen to activate power in your daughter, to unleash power onto your daughter for the breaking of the yoke. In Jesus' name. Anoint you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. You become a burden lifter and a yoke breaker by the Holy Spirit from this day onwards in your home in the mighty name of Jesus. One more. One more. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There is one more, and this one is for others outside of your home who also needs that touch. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Alan. Alrighty. You can put that away. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Oh, Lord, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. It is for you that that word came forth today. Ask the Lord privately why you have not been able to make a difference. And the Lord will reveal to you. He will give you a vision that will reveal the entrapment of the heart of the other. And the moment you see it, it will no longer have any power over you, but you will have power over it to see the love of God permeate the soul, permeate the heart, and bring about change. And the Lord is doing it for the sake of others who have suffered from this person's rigidity. Yes, for the sake of the others whose hearts have almost become closed also just because they cannot deal. 
The Lord is saying for their sake, the Lord is moving. He has chosen and appointed to reveal to you what it is. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, Rame in the Lialaba. Two days ago or so, the Lord said to me, Remind your brethren that if they seek me, they will find me. You need to up your game and seek in the Lord. Seek him with all of your heart and you will find him. In Jesus' name, God bless you, Diamond. God is good. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just don't be tired of telling them. You see, that's the word I hear from you. Don't be tired of telling them. He said, because the Lord has chosen to use the words of your mouth to soften their heart. So stretch your hand also. You receive the sword today in the name of Jesus. It's placed in your hand and with it, you will separate ignorance from the heart. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Sister Z, I want you to stand right here. Okay, perfect. God is good. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, you already have the sword. In fact, it's strong around you. You just need to pull it out and apply it. And just say, I take authority and preeminence over every foul spirit that has held this one hostage. I cut them completely off from his life in the mighty name of Jesus. And as you declare the word of the Lord, so shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus. The phone will ring and you will see a shift in the heart. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you because this one is ready to move. She will go and she will return with a great testimony of peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Draw your sword in the name of Jesus. It is the sword of the Lord that he has given to you for victory and for your peace. Ah, I see this woman saying, Lord, is that easy? Wow, yeah, that easy because the Lord has already given you the power. God is good. Brother Alan. Oh, yeah. Your brother Greg is also Brother Alan. You see, yeah. In case you didn't know, this is Alan Jr. You know, Father in the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, so the way this is going to work is you need to completely let them go. You understand what I mean? The posture of your heart to them has to be fully as though they were never difficult and they were never they had never wronged you. Because the moment you take that posture to genuinely search deep through and through within you to let them go and to receive them in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as though their stolidness and difficult behavior never was, guess what it will never be? Because it is by faith that you will receive this victory. Call them the things that are. You see, you call the things that are not as though they are, so that they can be. When you relate to a difficult person as though they're full of goodness, they will be full of goodness. You understand what I mean? But even you have to make sure that there is no registration of their wrong. That is, if anything at all, you are not tolerating, but you're celebrating them. Once you take that posture, kabuas kabayela, ismenda abayela, they will be brand new. Like a new bride being presented. That's how they will be in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for this man will move in your wisdom for peace and righteousness in Jesus' name. God is good. Alrighty. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost. I'm going to pray a different prayer for you. The prayer that I'm saying for you is that the Lord will keep you from the evil. In this particular situation, you will be kept. You will be kept in peace. And Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, the sword will be for removing you and severing you from the incense of a foul thought and a difficult heart. Whom the sun says free is free indeed, woman, you are free. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah, the sword takes you out from any entanglement, from any difficult situation, and from any poison of an unrepentant heart. You are made free. Untouchable, says the Lord. Unhurtable, says the Lord. He is your shield, your buckler, 
and your exceeding great reward. In the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. Hallelujah. Alrighty. Hallelujah. The battle is the Lord's. Okay? The battle is the Lord's. Stand therefore and do nothing. And watch every knee bow to the Lord Jesus. Call the name of Jesus often. The victory is yours. The battle is the Lord's. You see, the Lord sees, he sees and he knows that you need help and that you recognize that God is your help. So stand and do nothing. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus again as often as you can and you will see him move on your behalf. Every knee will bow. They don't want to bow to you, but they will bow to the Lord and the Lord is in you. What difference does it make? They still get a bow anyway. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. Mr. B, are you coming up? Oh yeah, are you here for prayers too? Okay, God is good. Let me just pray for my brother Mays first. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I want you to say these words after me. Lord, lead me to that word that holds the key to my victory. Let me see that word. Let me take that word. Let me ingest that word. Let me be one with that word in the mighty name of Jesus, because you get to use it multiple times. And so the Lord doesn't want you to just express a one-time victory over a difficult one. He wants you to enjoy multiple victories over several difficult ones. Yours is a calling, not just a, a testimony. It's a calling. The Lord is giving you a calling such that not just that person, but other kinds of people like that. You see, they will see you and their hearts will melt. And so let the Lord lead you to that word that you will own, that will become a weapon with which you would address such situations in the name of Jesus. You see that scripture of Ezekiel 36, 26, when the Lord gave that to me, it has helped me a great deal in multiple okay, on multiple occasions. And he wants to give you a word like that, that will melt hearts in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. So what the Lord revealed to me is that the one that you're standing here concerning whose heart needs to be softened, themselves have been hurt. Themselves, they are tired. And that's the reason why they've chosen self-preservation. And so we're going to pray for them that in the mighty name of Jesus, that they will find peace. Because when they're at peace, they will be peaceable with other people. When they find grace, they will have grace to give also. We pray for them that not only is their heart softened, but that they are also healed from the inside out. See, that fellow is loved by God, a child of God, who still has the grace and the opportunity in the time remaining to do good. The Lord is healing them from the inside out so that all the things that have gotten them tired, all the sacrifices that went unappreciated, that made them harden their hearts, the rewards of it will flash before their very face so that they will know that God is faithful. And that faithfulness of the Lord will begin to restore their confidence in the process of love and of generosity in the mighty name of Jesus. You already know what that is and how that is going to play out. And the Lord will make you see it in the land of the living. God bless you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, you will remain under authority. You will say to this one, go, and they will go. To this one, come, and will come. And to your servant, you will say, do this, and he will do this. Let me tell you something, anyone whose heart is hardened toward you, from today on, you will say what needs to be done and they will do it because you have stayed under the authority structure that God has brought you into. In the name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. Remember, you will say to them, do this and they will do it. And no one shall deny your authority. God bless you in Jesus' name. Alan. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. Father, we give you praise. Um, Brother Charles, if you could help us with the offering slide, you may see it on the left-hand side there. Thank you so much. Father, we give you praise. Let's just uh, bow our heads if you need, and offering envelope is there. We'll go ahead and proceed in our giving and faith and thanksgiving unto the Lord for what he's done this night. Lord, there's none like you. Father, you are from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you for your mercy, O oh God, for finding pleasure in us, O oh God, creating us for your pleasure. Father, we thank you for you have spoken to us plainly this night and have equipped us, O oh God. Let these offerings unto you, Lord, be sweet smelling. Let them be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we declare that all glory and honor belong to you and we receive, O oh God, already and give you praise the testimonies that shall come forth from this word that you have delivered 
to us, oh God, to strengthen us, to remind us of your goodness, to help us to not forget all of your benefits, oh God. We give you glory yet again. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord. I just want to remind us, we're still pressing in in prayer. We'll be online tomorrow, Wednesday, 9 p.m., second watch on Instagram at Chameleon House. Please join us if you haven't been on there yet for prayer. And we'll be back Saturday at 6.30. All righty, everyone have a blessed night.